Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session today on building smart and sustainable cities of the future. Uh, my name is JJ, and I'm with Gobi Partners. We're a pan-Asian venture capital firm with presence across North Asia, South Asia, and ASEAN, and have over 1.2 billion US dollars in assets under management, serving the emerging and underserved markets. And with us, sustainability has always been top of mind. So we've launched the Sustainability Innovation Webinar Series that is aimed at educating investors, entrepreneurs, and other key ecosystem players on tackling global issues and forwarding the UN SDGs. Um, I see a handful of our audience have actually attended our previous events, so thank you for your continued support. Um, and today we're excited to be talking about a concept that all of us living in cities will soon really start to see come to life, um, if you haven't already, which is smart cities. And especially with you know, rapid urbanization and cities being one of the biggest CO2 emitters and causes of climate change, um, we find this topic to be very timely. Um, now, there's a lot of components within what makes a smart city, especially with respect to sustainability in the UN SDGs. So we're fortunate to have our speakers today break it down for us so that by the end of the session, you'll walk away with a good understanding and knowledge of the topic. Um, our event today will consist of two segments. Uh, we'll start off by looking at how cities are becoming smart and looking at smart cities innovation from the venture capital perspective. Um, we'll then follow with a panel of innovators and practitioners right here in Asia to share their insights being at the forefront of these implementations. Um, for the Q&A, we'll be bringing the speakers back on live at the end of each session. So please put your, your questions into the Q&A function. Um, and let's see the time. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce our first segment where Paul Ark, who is an advisor at Gobi Partners and our moderator for today, has sat down with our managing partner, Kay Mok Koo. Um, we filmed this exclusive chat right here in our Bangkok office. And Kay Mok will be joining us on Zoom in 30 minutes to answer your questions. So um, let's dive right into it. Well, welcome everyone to our fireside chat. Today we're going to be talking about three topics that are uh, distinct but highly interrelated. You know, we're, we're talking about smart infrastructure, uh, we're talking about smart cities, and we're talking about sustainability. All three of which are starting to uh, attract increasing attention, uh, as well as investment in Asia Pacific. So, uh, you know, I'm quite fortunate to be joined today by my colleague, Mock, uh, who has been actively looking uh, in all three areas, as well as the rest of uh, Gobi Partners. So, to set the stage for our conversation today, you know, I'd like to share some facts uh, from the UN uh, that, that, that sort of give us some context for uh, these three topics. Um, I want to start by saying that, you know, it, it's estimated by, that, by the year 2050, Two-thirds of the global population will be residing in cities, compared to about 54% residing now. So we're going to see a shift of about 2.4 billion people uh, into cities over the next 20 years. Uh, cities currently occupy only about 2% of the Earth's surface, but they consume more than 75% of natural resources available globally. So the impact of cities uh, both in terms of, you know, population and resources is incredibly outsized. Uh, and then material consumption related to cities uh, will increase to 90 billion tons by 2050, compared to 40 billion tons in uh, 2010. So most of these resources are primarily energy, raw materials, water, and food. So, you know, the topic of infrastructure, cities, and sustainability is highly relevant to, you know, uh, the global population, global trends uh, over the next 20 years. So, you know, Mark, before we start throwing around terms like smart infrastructure and smart cities, you know, let, let's all get on the same page with our audience. How would you define smart infrastructure and smart cities and how are they related? Sure. So I think uh, maybe before I start, I think it's important to maybe set the stage. I think cities actually evolved during the uh, first industrial revolution, 
where there's mechanization and I think the creation of factories uh, actually allows all these uh, urban migration, people moving to cities uh, to look for jobs. Uh, so the reason why we're talking about smart cities is actually there's this, uh, I'll say, the macro situation, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, so a lot of these are uh, smart infrastructure that we're talking about, uh, really to me, uh, there's three fundamental building blocks. Uh, so these are 5G, uh, AI, and uh, Internet of Things, so IoT, right? Uh, so 5G, first of all, I just want to say that 5G maybe is a misnomer. Uh, so 5G is not really the next generation 4G, right? Uh, so what's important about 5G is actually, 5G actually has very low latency. So 5G is actually a groundbreaking technology that actually allows machine to talk to machine, right? So, so uh, technically, I think 5G should be called robotics 1G. This is really a technology that allows machines to talk to each other, right? And AI, of course, we know is important because uh, it actually allows machines to be smart, right? That's how we get intelligent machines. And Internet of Things, IoT, uh, effectively is a lot of sensor-based technologies uh, that allows machines to be aware, right? So I think with these three building blocks, uh, smart infrastructure, you really enable I think, automated uh, machines, smart machines. Uh, and together with, I think, other add-on technologies, like uh, you look at 3D printing, you're actually able to produce a customized product uh, at a very low volume, right? So you're able to create uh, new things uh, in, in the smart infrastructure. Uh, you have things like uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. I think those are very important visualization techniques that allows human to work better, to learn better. So I think that's also another critical building block of smart infrastructure. And because so much of these uh, asset nowadays are moving from fiscal, uh, to I'll say the digital uh, economy, cybersecurity is very important as well. So how do you actually protect those uh, assets when they're digital? Right? So cybersecurity is another major uh, building block of uh, this smart infrastructure. Uh, and if you look at smart city, what it is is really it's it's about an urban area where you know you have uh, people uh, living together. Uh, and how do you actually harness smart infrastructure to I'll say manage uh, you know resources, manage assets more efficiently, more effectively? Right. So of course, smart city will, uh, will use a lot of smart infrastructure technologies, uh, but they're not limited to just using smart infrastructure technologies, right? Because you, you do have to take care of, I'll say, existing areas like uh, waste management, you know, healthcare. Uh, I think those are other areas that smart city will, will focus on uh, that may not use a smart infrastructure. And, and I would imagine it would probably also include technologies that would fall outside of just infrastructure technologies, because you're, you're not just talking about you know, the processes, but you're talking about actual people, people that live together. You, know, you have to think about communities, you have to think about well-being, you have to think about morale and happiness. And so you know, smart cities is basically a concept that encompasses a wide variety of technologies that all have to find a way to sort of connect with one another uh, quite seamlessly. So, you know, that's why I guess infrastructure has to be a little bit smarter. Yes. Mm. Uh, fantastic. And, and so, you know, we have the idea of smart infrastructure and how that feeds into smart cities. You know, let's talk a little bit about sustainability because, you know, sustainability, you know, operates on three different dimensions. It operates not just on economic growth, uh, but it also is, you know, how do we how do we uh, disperse the benefits of economic growth uh, more inclusively among a greater percentage of the population? And how do we do all that without, uh, you know, overly taxing, you know, a cities or countries or the planet's resources? You know, in what ways do smart infrastructure and smart cities uh, connect with and even promote sustainability? Yeah, I think, uh, so first thing is actually we, we should not forget, uh, I think a lot of time when we talk about technology, we tend to emphasize the, the negative aspect, you know, it's actually uh, disruptive, right? Uh, but a lot of times what you see, you look at it uh, more on a uh, objective level, uh, technologies create new economic opportunities as well, right? So, so the typical examples, uh, you know, would be like, let's say, you know, we're moving to a renewable energy, right? So of course, I think in the traditional fossil fuel, industry, you get a reduction of the workforce, right? But because of this new uh, industry, new uh, renewable sector, you actually create new jobs, right? Or you look at uh, what has happened in the past decade, uh, there's been a lot of sharing economy. So what the sharing economy has allowed us to do is, uh, I think people used to have a lot of these underutilized assets, whether it's their own cars or their own houses. 
uh, now they actually can monetize them, right? So they create new economic opportunities as well, right? So, so technologies does uh, promote economic growth. I think the other areas that you, you talk about, technology can play on, right? So, so let's say in terms of uh, social equality, right? Uh, if you look at, uh, let's say, you're a handicapped person, uh, generally living in a traditional city, sometimes uh, you face a lot of obstacles mm. uh, that uh, you know, normal people may not realize. But think about if you have technologies, right? we only smart infrastructure, uh, just the fact that if you can create a smart wheelchair. Mm. So, so you know, if you're a handicapped, you know, before you have all these problems you know, going through onto the sidewalk and so on, with a smart wheelchair, the wheelchair actually can just climb the smart walk. In fact, it can actually even cross over the overhead bridge for this handicap. Uh, so in that case, uh, you use technology in the right way. It does reduce that social inequality. Mm. Right? And I think the, the last thing that uh, you mentioned is in terms of the, I'll say the, the environment, right? Uh, so with this emphasis on circular economy, uh, there's a heightened sense of how do we actually harness technology, right? All the way, right, from the supply side, uh, in terms of uh, you know, managing the production, right? How do you find better ways to produce food, for example, mm. right? To managing consumption, right? I think a lot of utility consumption, you know, it, it, you know, it's probably a lot of wastage. So how do you use technology to actually minimize those uh, wastage? And finally, obviously, is the uh, recycling of uh, these waste products. Uh, technology can play a major role there. So we actually reduce a lot of these uh, inefficiencies uh, in the uh, economy itself. And I would imagine, you know, that all feeds back into, you know, when you create new economies around, uh, you know, production, around recycling, around waste management, you know, that, that not only impacts the economy, but it also creates new economic opportunities as well. New types of jobs and areas that, you know, um, might not have existed. That's right. And, you know, I think, you know, I, I know one of the really great examples, uh, you know, particularly around energy, is you know the fear that you know uh, jobs in the coal industry in the U.S. are you know declining or China, uh, but I think what very few people talk about is how you know the solar industry is adding jobs faster than you know what people in the coal industry are losing. And what's also quite interesting, I think, what people don't talk about is that a lot of those solar jobs installing. You know, solar panels actually happen in the cities. So you're moving jobs away from like remote coal mines to yes. jobs that are in the cities um, that probably provide higher growth, more economic opportunity, uh, more inclusive, and at the same time better for the environment. So you know, I think that's that's a really fascinating thing about these types of disruptive technologies is that it leads to impacts that you know many people haven't figured out yet. Mm -hmm. so they, they worry about the downside they haven't quite imagined. Yeah, I think that's it, it's true. I think part of the thing is uh, because when an industry is declining, uh, you can foresee the decline. So, so that's something that is more certain. You, you know exactly yeah. which jobs are going to get lost. You just have no idea what jobs are going to be created. That's right. Whereas the upside is actually unexpected. It's uncertain. I think that's why it's sometimes, a lot of times, not factored into the calculation. Yeah. So no one could have predicted a few years ago that you know social influencer would be a job category. Precisely. Uh, you know, but they only know that these are the you know newspaper journalists that disappears. You know, so, um, that's true. So you know we have an idea of what 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 cities are trying to do and how they're evolving uh, and some of the the, the the smart infrastructure technologies that they're leveraging. You know, do, do you have any you know to, to sort of bring it down to earth for our audience? You know, do you have any interesting examples mm -hmm. of cities that are becoming smarter and leveraging some of these infrastructure? Technologies. Sure. So I think uh, because my expertise, I've been living in Asia for I would say the bulk of my life. Uh, so maybe I'll just focus on cities uh, in Asia. Uh, so examples I'll bring up. I think a lot of time when we look at smart cities, there's also uh, an acceptable social norm, right? Because uh, some of the underlying uh, practices that's been put in place by some of these smart cities may or may not be acceptable by you know, different societies. So I'll give you an example. Let's say in China, right? So in China, what they have done is. Uh, they are basically digitized uh, every residence, every citizen's uh, face. So it's actually captured in a centralized database. Uh, so if you were to go to Hangzhou, right, which is the, uh, I'll say the hometown of Alibaba, you can actually check into an Alibaba hotel. Uh, if you're a Chinese resident, you effectively just need to scan your ID card. And because the ID card is actually linked to this spatial database, uh, you'll be assigned a room. So there's no key. You just walk up to the room, and the door itself actually has you know, facial recognition built in. 
right? So just by looking at you, they'll recognize that hey, you are the legitimate occupier of this room. You can just open the door and walk in. And once you check into this hotel, uh, everything is all controlled by a voice activated speaker. It's a Google Home, like a Siri, right? So, so that's how advanced they are in, in uh, like for example, China. Everything is seamless. Uh, there's so, no manual intervention. So when you do that, you're basically, so people are saving time mm -hmm. from the check-in, check-out process. Mm -hmm. uh, it's increasing security, because mm -hmm. now it's like the doors are verifying people's identity. Correct. Um, you're probably saving a lot of plastic from not having to issue these plastic key cards. Precisely. So there are just like three different level order effects beyond just you know, the ease of getting in and out of the room, that's quite fascinating. Yes, there's no wastage, uh, there's no human intervention in the whole process. And as you see, it's actually very secure. Mm. Right. Uh, the other example that's very interesting is obviously my uh, home city of Singapore. Uh, so if you look at Singapore itself, it's actually a very densely populated island, right? Uh, it's about, I would say, 700 square kilometers with a population of 5 million. So it's probably the size of Las Vegas, but you know, let's say maybe three to five times the population. Uh, but you don't get the kind of traffic problems that you see in some of these big metropolis, right? Mm. Uh, part of it is actually Singapore has been very holistic uh, in terms of managing the, the transportation system, right? So they have a very good public transportation system that takes away a lot of these need for private transportation, right? But even within the, I'll say the realm of private transportation, uh, Singapore has been very efficient in terms of using technology to optimize private transportation through obviously electronic road pricing. So these are basically tolls that you your car go through and actually you know, charge you based on that usage. And, and that, that is actually to me the ultimate form of private transportation control. Is this usage based pricing, uh, which I'll say that the parties can use to manage this private uh, traffic. And so I would imagine these types of technologies would also be able to track, you know, driving behavior as well. So, I mean, and, and that, that, that's quite interesting because then you start moving into areas like, say, telematics, mm -hmm. driving behavior, being able to adjust, you know, uh, you know, insurance rates based on, you know, risk of driver behavior. And so now you're, you're starting to see this convergence between, you know, things like traffic management, yes. uh, FinTech, mm -hmm. you know, again, public safety, yeah. So yeah, so it, it definitely sounds like you know when you start talking about these types of technologies and you start talking about what the cities are doing, you know it's not limited to just a specific sector, but now you start touching on multiple sectors, multiple use cases, multiple areas to generate value and control risk. Then there's this correct. I think part of these things when you start with the uh, I'll say the infrastructural level, you do have a lot of these uh, you know downstream application I mentioned uh, regarding all these insurance. Uh, of course, the, the way that we implement it is actually has to be a, a consumer permission based uh, kind of system, but uh, it does work right. So, all this uh, traffic behavior uh, that's been manifested, uh, you can actually apply to downstream applications like you know, insurance premiums, for example. Mm. Yes. Uh, so, it, it, it's quite interesting that you, you chose two examples from Asia because you know, mm. there, there, there's global movements and thinking around uh, making cities smarter. Uh, and, and if I look at some of the, 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 the stats in my notes, you know, as of the first quarter of uh, 2021, uh, there were over 1,300 cities around the world uh, that have launched 5G networks. So we're talking about how 5G is a bit of a, an enabling technology for a host of other downstream technologies. So 1,300 cities around the world that have launched 5G networks, which is a 350% a increase over the previous year, uh, despite the pandemic. But what I find quite interesting is that of those 1,300 cities, Asia leads the way. Asia has about 528 cities, uh, followed by you know Europe, Middle East, uh, and then finally uh, the United States. So you know um, it, it does it does seem like the cities in Asia are you know establishing itself as sort of a front runner mm -hmm. for a lot of different smart city schemes. Uh, in terms of rolling out and testing smart infrastructure. How, how do you see that playing into kind of this smart city, smart infrastructure future? Obviously they're they're jumping ahead. Where does that where where would that potentially place the US in sort of you know creating uh, future technology hubs uh, you know into the rest of the 21st century? 
I think that's an interesting question. I think if you look at just a macro picture, I think Asia accounts for probably about 60% of the uh, global population. Uh, but I think what's more interesting is the fact that uh, the population in Asia is actually very young. Uh, so therefore, um, there's going to be a lot of uh, urban urbanization uh, driven by this migration to, to cities. Uh, so if you think deeply about it, I think the middle class of the future will actually happen in Asia, right? Uh, which means when you have the younger folks, the middle class happening in Asia, uh, those tend to be a driver of new technologies. Right? So that augurs very well for the acceptance of new technologies. I think today, if you were to just travel between uh, Western countries and Asia, uh, the first thing you re you'll realize is actually, obviously, the airports in Asia are new, much nicer. Uh, if you were to take the subway trains, uh, the experience in Asia is just a very modern experience. Uh, so that augurs very well for the fact that Asia will become the driver uh, for some of these, uh, of these smart cities, uh, smart infrastructure, uh, compared to the Western societies. Okay, so let me ask you. So, so you know, as venture capitalists, yes. um, you know, we're, we're always concerned with not just exciting technologies, but technologies that are potentially uh, huge impact. You know, so let me ask from that VC perspective, you know, what, how big are the opportunities, mm -hmm. economic opportunities, investment opportunities, are there in smart infrastructure technologies, smart city initiatives, uh, both globally and even regionally? Sure. So, so you look at the year 2025, uh, so the global uh, economy is going to be worth at least $100 trillion, right? And just a smart city, smart infrastructure, the market estimated to be about 5%. So there's five trillion dollars. But I think what, what's more important is the fact that uh, this uh, smart city market is going to be growing at over 20% a year. Uh, so in, in other words, within five years, it's actually going to triple in size. So this is definitely a, a very attractive market for us because uh, as a VC, we're definitely looking for picking up market, high growth market. So it, it fits into right, all these uh, criteria. And so, uh, so let me ask you, up until over the last few years, because you know, Gobi has been fairly active investor across many markets in Asia, yes. a variety of different verticals. Have you seen any technologies or startups that have been particularly exciting in terms of advancing a smart city's agenda? Mm. Uh, definitely, I think, uh, so maybe I'll highlight a few uh, examples of technologies or companies that we've seen. Uh, so number one is actually within the uh, drone industry. Uh, so we've seen a company's called uh, Aerodyne. I think it actually started uh, implementing drone inspection services uh, for industrial sector, so they actually did it for uh, offshore oil rigs. Uh, but they recently expanded to uh, urban settings, so they're actually using drone uh, for building inspection. And where we see this uh, drone technology going is, is, is there's a lot of uh, potential uh, because you think about let's say trash collection, right? Uh, nowadays, obviously, we have to separate trash into recyclables and, and so on, right? But a lot of times for for people, that's actually a very Good job, mm. right? So think about the smart drones of the future. Yeah, what happens if they become this uh, automatic garbage collector, right? They can go around the cities and hunt for garbage, and better still, right? They can figure out mm. what kind of garbage is recyclable. So using like sort of computer vision and AI to say, okay, that's you know paper, yes. that's glass, Correct. and then they don't require humans to sort all that out. Yes, themselves. Because they always throw the thing in the wrong bin, right? I don't worry about you, but you know. So there are some of these, I think, human challenges when they ask to do some of these uh, uh, classification job, right? So, so definitely, I think uh, drones has a lot of uh, potential in this area. Uh, the other technology that uh, we are quite excited about is actually in terms of autonomous driving, right? So currently, there's just a lot of excitement about electric vehicles, EV, right? Uh, but you think about the, the, the uh, I'll say the digital economy, electric vehicle is just like the, the, the dark feature for my right? like Nokia phone, right? Because you still have to drive the, the car itself. Right? So even though it is an electric vehicle, it's a manual vehicle, right? So the next big area is really about autonomous driving. And the companies that we're excited about uh, includes companies like AutoX, right? Uh, it's a company that you know, came from the, the West, but they will focus on, I'll say, autonomous driving in an Asian context. So, so you and I, we live in Asia, we know that the traffic here is definitely not uh, like California, right? It's, it's actually more chaotic. So there's a lot of diversity of use cases that autonomous uh, driving technologies need to cater to uh, in Asia that doesn't exist, let's say, in the US. Right, right. So this area, autonomous driving, you know, uh, we think there's going to be quite a number of winners 
whoever can figure out how to operate in a very chaotic environment such as an agency. Definitely, I think if you look at artificial intelligence, the, the determinant of how smart your system is, is actually the data set. So you can say that maybe these uh, technologies that's been trained in Asia, they're definitely street smart, more street smart than those trained in the US. And, and what about technologies going forward? So, you know, as, as you look at, you know, what sort of technologies will be emerging over the next few years? What, 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 what gets you and what gets Gobi partners excited? Uh, and what are the what are the key investment opportunities that, that all of us should be thinking about? Yeah, I would say that because we are moving into this new fourth industrial revolution, uh, there's just a lot of opportunities across the uh, whole value chain, from upstream to downstream. So maybe I can just start with, let's say, upstream. So I don't know about yourself, but uh, during the pandemic, at the start of the pandemic, I actually got myself a VR headset. Mm. I was playing Beat Saber all the time, but uh, you realize actually the VR headset is actually very heavy and clunky. Uh, so there's a lot of technologies that we're seeing in the VR space where how do you actually uh, you know, turn you know, regular monitors into a VR headset without having you put on a VR headset. Uh, I think whoever figured out first, there's a lot of opportunities because you can replace I'll say, multiple monitors you know, in the financial industry, in the gaming industry. So I think that's definitely an area that uh, we're looking at. Uh, the other area has to do with the uh, so-called these Internet of Things sensors. Uh, so if you look at uh, the current situation, uh, there's a lot of demand from a semiconductor chip, right? It's basically computing chip. But if you look forward, uh, because of IoT, there will be all sorts of sensors that will be in demand, right? Uh, whether it's temperature sensor, uh, pressure sensor, and so on. And all these sensors do require customized chips, right? So we'll also see uh, a lot of uh, I'll say evolution in these microelectromechanical chips, and there's going to be a lot of uh, opportunities in there as well, right? So these are the, the upstream. Uh, opportunities. If you look at further downstream, uh, so even just think about the pandemic, um, uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunities now in the telehealth space, right? I think before regulators may, may actually have a lot of these applications uh, kind of have them only appear in the offline context, right? You have to go to hospitals and see a doctor. But what the pandemic has done is a lot of regulators now are actually much more uh, forthcoming in terms of approving some of these telehealth apps. So I think in Asia, this is going to be a game changer because think about the public hospitals, right? Uh, they're actually overwhelmed, right? But with a lot of these telehealth platforms, you can actually democratize the access to mm -hmm. these public hospitals, I'll say to the mass consumers. So, so telehealth uh, definitely is an area that, uh, you know, we are, you know. And, and that's quite interesting because it's not even just, uh, you know, video consultation, but because you know, the computer vision and AI is getting really good. You know, you can start diagnosing. You don't even need super advanced video setups. You know, yes. I think you know they're now building in functionality with something like smartphones yes. that can diagnose basic conditions. You know, melanomas and skin cancers and all sorts of conditions. So, you know, the idea that um, you, you have a smart city that's pushing a lot of city services. Yes. Uh, you know, to the end user without having to get everyone to come to one point, whether it's a hospital or, uh, you know, and, and you're not even just talking about health, you know, those technologies would work for education, yes. it would work for anything that would normally have required, you know, in-person yes. uh, interaction. You're right. So think about, like, I think a lot of conditions actually can be uh, diagnosed using just retinal scanning, right? So, so if all these things can happen, you know, uh, you actually kind of uh, making all these healthcare much more affordable, right, to these consumers. And I guess it's also treatment if you talk about the fourth industrial revolution, you're talking about, you know, um, robotics 1.0. Yes. Now it's like you're not even just diagnosing remotely, but you can treat remotely through robots. Yes. You, know, you can have surgeons that are using uh, robotics and VR, AR, right. to, to can do surgeries yes. uh, from remote distances. So, you know, all, you know, very, very interconnected. Correct, definitely agree with you on that. Uh, I think uh, the other big area we're looking at further downstream is uh, in terms of food and agri-tech. So obviously if you look at the, the current, uh, the traditional uh, mechanism of uh, producing protein, let's say through raising cattle and beef, 
it's just not going to be sustainable because there's so much of pollution you know, generated from cattle production. Uh, so there's going to be, a, I'll say, a lot of innovation on the production side uh, in terms of how do we find new ways to create, let's say, meat, so protein, or even new ways of uh, creating alternative protein. So I think those are also big areas where, uh, given that we are going to have a lot of Asian consumers demanding for some of these uh, protein, uh, how do we find more efficient ways to actually produce it? So let me ask as a sort of a final question. You know that uh, you know in you know COVID has sort of transformed not just the way we live, but sort of the landscape in technology from you know ecosystems where we're looking at uh, digitization of products, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, adaptations of business models. Uh, and post-COVID now, you know, as we start thinking about, you know, how do we deal with public health issues, how do we deal with, um, you know, economic growth and sustainability, you know, there's a shift towards technological innovation. So more of a balance between not just the business model, but also the, the, the technology innovation. Um, in light of the shift, what are some of the changes in mindset that have to happen among stakeholders, whether it's investors, entrepreneurs, consumers, governments, corporates, mm -hmm. as we kind of move from a pre-COVID world into a post-COVID world uh, and one that in involves smart infrastructure, smart cities, sustainability? Uh, I think the, the key is about balance. I think, uh, you know, obviously before the COVID world, uh, you know, I'll say that the industry, uh, you know, both entrepreneurs, both investors, uh, may be very focused on growth for the sake of growth itself. Uh, you know, I think with this pandemic, uh, it's a good time to reflect. Uh, I think if you think about uh, all these KPIs that we have uh, for companies, uh, they're actually uh, very focused on growth but it's not holistic sets of uh, KPIs, right? Uh, the question is, there's a lot of externalities that's actually not captured you know, with this you know, growth-driven mindset. Uh, I think moving forward is actually how to balance this short-term focus on, I'll say, you know, economic or company KPIs with something that's wider, like you mentioned sustainability, right? So in terms of the social kind of KPIs, uh, how inclusive is you know, the product that you're offering, right? Uh, in terms of the impact on the environment, right? So I think uh, what will change is we do have to have a more holistic ways of measuring right, the uh, actual success of these companies. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think uh, beyond pursuing all these short-term like, business model growth, uh, we, it also behooves us to actually focus on a lot of these long-term, longer-term science-based innovation. How do we actually incorporate that into companies? Right? So I'll say, you know, obviously on the measurement side, uh, in terms of innovation, how do we actually take into account some of these deeper tech? Uh, you know, we have to be more patient. Uh, so I think over at uh, Gobi side, uh, uh, we're focused on ESG uh, because it provides a lot of these, I'll say, holistic uh, measurement that allows to uh, allows us to make our more balanced uh, investment. And this is something that uh, I think all the other the ecosystem players, whether you're talking about entrepreneurs, corporation, academia, we all have to come together. Well, you know, and I think that's doubly important simply because, you know, COVID has only highlighted, you know, just how vulnerable um, a lot of elements in our economy is, both from a people perspective, from, you know, uh, trade networks, infrastructure perspective. Uh, and I think just the idea of thinking about sustainability and incorporating ESG is you know, no longer a nice to have, but in order to control for risk, in order to look for opportunities in a somewhat more uncertain chaotic world, you know, we all have to, you know, think about, you know, sustainability and ESG and how we integrate it in the different technologies we look at. So, you know, I think that is a fantastic point to, to close out our chat with. So, you know, Mark, thank you very much for sharing your insights uh, with us. And, you know, we, we invite the audience to uh, stick around for our panel where we're actually going to get an opportunity to talk to practitioners uh, in the smart infrastructure and the smart city space. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Bob. Hey, Mark.
Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, welcome everyone to the Q&A portion of uh, our chat with uh, K-Maku. Uh, Mark, that was, a, that was a really great session and I hope uh, everyone uh, learned as much about smart infrastructure and smart cities as I did. Um, you know, so we actually do have uh, a number of questions that have come in, and I do invite the audience to submit any additional questions you might have uh, via the Q and A box. Uh, but, but, but not mock. We're not going to be pulling any punches. We actually have quite a, a challenging question right out of the gate. Um, yeah. We have someone who's asking: um, Isn't five G overkill for uh, most real smart city IoT solutions? Uh, most sensors, meters, switches only need LP1 bandwidth. 5G infrastructure is very expensive and requires high capacity batteries due to the high power required for 5G sensors and mesh networks. So is, is 5G just too much? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a good question. I think without going into too much te technical details, I'll say that I think uh, 5G adoption a lot of times is, is not just a technical consideration. Uh, so if you ask me, uh, if I just look at history, uh, so if we rewind the clock, uh, you know, many years ago, people were asking, hey, why do I need broadband networks when I have a DVD, you know, connected to a dial-up internet? Uh, why do I need to create a new port on my wall, for example? Uh, so I think some of these things, uh, a lot of it, uh, if you look at technology adoption, I'll say that uh, it's either non-linear or maybe not incremental. Uh, if you look at 5G, I think there's just, I'll say there's a lot of mind share. I think there's a government policy behind it, you know, when they actually have the uh, 5G auction, obviously that attracts uh, operators to come in as well. So I'll say that hey, even though I think the, you know, 5G at this stage uh, may seem like an overkill, uh, but it could be uh, part of the trend. Uh, so I'll say that, hey, look, uh, you know, besides technical consideration, it's actually a much more uh, complex uh, consideration when it comes to the adoption of these type of technologies. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think you bring up some fantastic points. So I'd love to just, uh, you know, add on to that. So I'll, I'll also, you know, help, you know, answer that a bit. You know, I, I think, you know, the, the, the key thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these types of technologies, these, these sort of smart infrastructure technologies, uh, you know, are, are, you know, they, they develop on an exponential curve. So, you know, these are the types of technologies that in the earliest days are probably way too expensive, uh, probably too efficient. And, you know, if you remember, you know, the early mobile phones, it was like basically these huge brick like devices, uh, you know, that would sit in, you know, a car. Uh, and now, you know, they're, they're, they, they, they fit in our pocket. And so, you know, I think like any technology, uh, you know, something like 5G and particularly, uh, the development of battery technology, uh, you know, these technologies improve over time. You know, uh, I, I think the, the the folks at Singularity U University love to say that in any given technology, today is the worst that this technology is going to be. Uh, it only gets better with every new day. Um, and so 5G might seem like overkill today if it's only a bunch of sensors. Uh, and IoT, but in 5, 10, 15 years when, uh, you know, these networks have to manage, you know, thousands upon thousands of autonomous vehicles, uh, billions of sensors, uh, you know, I think we're probably going to be complaining that, you know, 5G is not powerful enough. And we're going to be talking about 6G. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, very, very good point. Uh, you know, I, I'd also like to ask a question uh well it's a question coming in uh from uh the managing director of uh, gen pakistan um you know his, his original question is you know is how to plan to convert a small village into a sustainable model village of the future I, i'd like to reorganize that question in a little bit to basically ask that are only you know the most urban of cities today uh, the only candidates to become smart cities, or does smart infrastructure have the potential to make smaller population centers smart? You know, so is smart cities only a concept for the biggest cities today, or can you know smaller towns and villages and hamlets become you know sort of mini smart cities? And how so? How can technology help you know, these smaller population centers? I think the key is actually uh, price points. I think for if you look at villages. 
I think probably the income is not as high as uh, you know CDs. Uh, so if you just want to look at real life example, just look at uh, smartphones. So if you once again, if you rewind the clock, let's say 20 years, uh, if you take a kind of PC paradigm, uh, what the uh, makers of PC were trying to do was they're trying to create these $100 uh, PC so that you, you can actually uh, have those PCs in the village. But what ended up happening is actually all these uh, cheap uh, smartphones uh, that cost about $100. And if you go to any villages, let's say in uh, even Southeast Asia, uh, there, there's no real need for a fiscal bank anymore in this village uh, because all of these uh, banking actually happens uh, through that smartphones. So I think uh, that's one example, right? So once you have, uh, I'll say a smart device uh, that is priced correctly, uh, that's how you actually bring smart infrastructure to villages. So, so basically any type of technology that would allow a village to bypass traditional infrastructure. So rather than lay down copper wire, let's just put up some cell towers, rather than build a bank branch, which is probably too expensive for most small towns, let's just go to digital banking. So really find ways of, you know, bypassing traditional urban infrastructure. Uh, and so, again, I, I imagine that's a lot of it's going to depend on, you know, um, very, very digitally oriented technologies and sort of the price points coming down to the point where it's just radically cheaper uh, to do these types of services on a smartphone uh, than an actual building. Yep. Um, the smart devices basically disrupt the uh, traditional uh, cost structure. Okay. Well, it, we got one. We got enough time for one more quick question before we actually need to move to the panel. So, um, you know, just to kind of pull things back out and take things at a broad level, what, what would you say are probably the, the key elements of success for a smart city? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, once again, I want to emphasize that uh, I think one key element of success for smart city uh, is actually not technology, but I think it's actually uh, an appropriate level of smartness, I think, for the society. I think that's a very important point. I think if you, if you think deeply about what is a smart city, right? So, so a computer is actually a, a smart machine that uh, actually lives in a box, let's say, uh, you know, next to our table, right? But a smart city is basically a computer. Basically, the difference is actually for a smart city we're going to be living in this computer, right? So, so what sort of behavior is actually acceptable when we live in this uh, computer, right? Uh, for some people, they, they may feel that, hey, look, uh, there's certain privacy. Uh, I do not want the city to be too smart, right? So I think what's important about smart city in the future is there'll be all these different smart cities around the world. Uh, they'll be each uh, be very different because the societal norms or what is acceptable as smartness from this computer, this uh, CD that we're living in will be different. So I think that's one of the key elements is actually uh, society acceptance of what is a smart CD. Mm. Mark, I'm gonna try and squeeze in one more question because we just caught one coming in and it looks like it's targeted towards a VC. Uh, and uh, Kun uh, Charan Tip asks, what are the potential opportunities for a startup who's working on disruptive technology related to smart cities infrastructure to get funding or support in terms of partnership with tech corporate yeah so basically think, what are the opportunities for funding okay <laughs> that's a good question i think a lot of the smart city technologies the upstream that i mentioned uh they likely will appear in the more advanced uh, economies uh, i i guess uh, that's where most of the r d research is coming from i think in the emerging markets there will be a lot of opportunities uh, in terms of uh, i'll say implementation uh, because a lot of this uh, smart city infrastructure ultimately has to be localized uh, to suit the environment, right? So, so for example, I think there's going to be a lot of, uh, of smart cities being built in you know, places like Philippines, uh, Indonesia. Uh, they, these are tropical environment. Uh, so whatever technology, smart city technologies we're bringing into these markets uh, probably needs to be customized for the local conditions. So those will be opportunities for investment there. Mark, well, thank you very much. Uh, and JJ, I think we finished uh, 1.45 Bangkok time on the dot. So... Uh, we are on schedule. All right. Thank you, Paul and Mark, for that. Uh, that was a really great overview of what you know a smart city is with some interesting case studies and looking at key technologies that are coming out of the space. Um, now we'd like to shift and take a closer look at how practitioners and leaders here in Asia are tackling this problem. Um, again, please put your questions in the Q&A function and our panelists will answer them live at the end. Um, I'd like to invite Paul back up to kick off our next panel.
welcome everyone to our uh, panel. I'm very excited about our panel today, you know, we, we bring together, uh, you know, three people with very, very different perspectives to talk about, you know, smart infrastructure, smart cities, and tying that into sustainability. Our, our first guest is uh, uh, Callum Hanforth from UNDP, uh, the United Nations Development Program, who sort of brings that, that macro perspective. He's done a lot of work uh, on, uh, you know, smart cities at a strategy and policy level. Uh, in several jurisdictions. So, you know, he, he's able to sort of compare and contrast how uh, various municipalities are approaching the smart cities uh, concept. Uh, and then we also have uh, Shannon Kalyanamit with 5G Catalyst Technologies, who is, you know, busy, you know, laying down, you know, that infrastructure foundation, you know, 5G sort of being that, that technology that's going to power all the other technologies that build off of that to enable smart cities. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, Kamarul Mohammed, CEO and co-founder of Aerodyne Group, which is, you know, not only the second largest drone company in the world, but probably one of the most exciting startups to come out of the Southeast Asia region. Uh, and he's going to share with us perspectives of drone technology in both a smart cities context uh, and a sustainable cities context. So uh, great to have the three of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having uh, us. Um, I'd like to start off with, uh, with Callum uh, and, and to kick off with our panel and set the stage for our discussion. I wanted to ask you the same question I asked my colleague Mock in the fireside chat, uh, where Mock brought a venture capital perspective. Mm -hmm. you know, I'd be interested in getting the broader, more strategic perspective that someone who's worked with UNDP might be able to provide. So can you define for us in the audience, uh, what is a smart city? Thank you, Paul, it's, it's great to be here. Um, so I think we need to look at this kind of broader context of um, significant urbanization around the world. So prior to COVID-19, um, by 2050, we're looking at almost 70% of the world's population will be living in a city. And although in some of the um, cities around the world, we did see a slight blip in the sense of um, urbanization was um, halting or even reversing in the context of the pandemic, um, it does seem to be a kind of continued and inexorable trend as well. And we see many people moving to cities to improve their lives, to improve their livelihoods, to find opportunities, prosperity, and, and so on. So in that kind of context, we need to make sure that these spaces work for everyone. So that's about improving, um, making them uh, inclusive places to live, making livable places to actually um, to have a family, to um, have a career and so on, but also sustainable places um, to live and work too. Um, and so for us at UNDP and, and more broadly, smart cities are a really fundamental way of making those cities inclusive, livable and sustainable. Um, and I think for us, it's very important that when we talk about um, smart cities, we're not just talking about the, the really important technology components like 5G, like big data um, and so on, but also about tech and innovation. Um, and that innovation includes things like behavior change, uh, better urban planning, um, but also increasingly things like nature-based solutions as well. So for us, a smart city takes a slightly broader definition of tech and innovation uh, to make these kind of urban spaces uh, work for, for all the people that call them home. So based on that definition, it sounds like smart cities is not just throwing technology at the problem, but really sort of thoughtful, holistic systems planning and systems thinking, uh, you know, not just the technology, but also the experience uh, of, of how urban dwellers live and interact. That's, that's exactly it. I think in the case of any tech oriented issue, we want to go back to the, the kind of user needs and the problem that we're looking to tackle. Um, technology is very much one tool to, to achieve that. And we're seeing phenomenal efforts by things like 5G, uh, big data, AI, and, and so on. But tech is very much one tool in the kind of smart city toolkit. So if as you're, you're completely right, is that kind of systems level piece um, that I think is very, very important to focus on. And in your work with UNDP, have you found that many cities around the world approach smart city policy and development strategies in, in relatively similar or uniform ways? Or are there regional differences in how countries define, approach, or implement smart cities? It's, it's a really interesting question, and, and actually, there's something we encounter quite a bit, where um, because this kind of tech-centric notion has been so dominant for so long, 
um, many cities see a kind of a smart city journey as being from where they are now on a kind of linear pathway towards somewhere like Singapore. Um, and that journey definitely has some merit for, for some cities, but it's by no means uh, the whole definition of, of the kind of smart city journey. Um, I think the struggle that we sometimes see when that kind of tech notion is so centric is that some uh, city leaders and city officials see smart cities as being conceptually, financially, and, and broadly um, irrelevant to them, which for us is a real shame because, as I mentioned earlier, smart cities are a really important way um, of, Im of improving people's lives and livelihoods in the kind of urban space. So I think what's really exciting in that sense is that we see many cities exploring uh, smart cities using a very kind of problem definition approach. So looking at the kind of challenges and issues that face them in their, in their cities, and then using tools like tech or innovation more broadly uh, to tackle them. Um, so one example that we see is around climate change, um, particularly things like flooding um, and so on. So you'll see some cities like many in Vietnam who will be taking quite high tech approaches. So using things like flooding apps, uh, data, uh, internet of things, sensors and so on to kind of monitor flooding. Um, somewhere like Singapore is also using that approach, but also using things like uh, nature-based solutions. So we've got a park here um, in Bishan, which has been designed as a kind of urban floodplain to try to kind of soak up flood water to then route it into the drainage network. Um, and then another city that we work very closely with in, in Senegal, uh, Dakar, um, one suburb there um, has been diverting flood water into kind of pastures to irrigate herbs. Um, and that then provides women and other kind of informal workers in that community um, with a product that they can then sell in the informal economy. So what we see is these are all very different models of a smart city, um, but also um, the usefulness of taking like a problem definition approach to, to apply uh, smart city tools, whether tech or innovation more broadly. Okay, so, so no cookie cutter solutions. Exactly. You know, the, the, the needs of each city is gonna really depend on its particular circumstance. Despite the fact that I think every city is gonna have uh, different problem solution sets, you know, all of them are going to have to operate sort of off of the same, you know, some sort of base infrastructure layer. You know, you, you can't really have a, a smart city without having uh, technology and smart city infrastructure underpinning it. So, you know, I, I, I want to bring Shannon into the conversation now because, you know, 5G is, is, is being looked at as that foundational technology that will drive additional infrastructure technologies uh, that leverage the power of 5G. So Shannon, I want to ask, you know, what are some of the more critical technologies that you expect to proliferate as a result of wider 5G rollout. So sort of building off of the infrastructure that you and your company are laying down, uh, you know, particularly as it relates to smart cities. You know, it's um, it's interesting. I was just listening to, to what Caleb was, was talking about. One of the biggest misconception before we even get to the prolific technologies is that whenever we talk about smart cities, people always think, oh, robots or like sci-fi movies in the year 2050. And then we're going to have like flying machines and, and cars and everything. So again, one of the biggest misconceptions that I deal with, especially when I'm talking to municipalities, um, is that, you know, what you said, in order for any kind of smart city to work the main fundamental we need to do is just have an underlying basic infrastructure. The main thing that that usually people don't understand before we get to the robots and you know all of that stuff is we're just trying to interconnect all data in the city to make things much more so you have all of your data all at your fingertips in one stop shop. So like for example in specifically in I mean forget um, Barcelona or London or Shanghai or whatever. We're just talking about Southeast Asia right now. And as you know, being in Thailand, the DMV records and the ID card records, and then, you know, the, the, the weather records, all these, the data that we have on a local, regional and national level is not even connected to now the new types of information and data that we have coming from the IoT. So we have the non-IoT data, which is what we just mentioned. And then we have the IoT data, which is all the additional information. So like the sensors from the water meters, from the pollution, from the traffic controls, with all of this stuff. So, so one, one 
understanding that I usually have to start off with when I'm talking to anybody is smart cities is just the first step. Let's just build the first underlying fundamental. And that's just the interconnectability of all the data sets um, at, at your fingertips in one stop shop. So before we get even to the amazing technologies, we need to have that. And so um, as we're building along this infrastructure and having all the, the data at the, your fingertips, sometimes one of the issues that we get when we're talking to people is, um, well, now that all the data is there, so now what? You know, so what does that mean? And so what that means is now the, the mayor office has that data. Um, if there's a flood, if there's a, an earthquake, if there's a car crash, that data is also being sent to the police station who has you know, the same access to it. Then the you know, 911 or 191 or the emergency calls are on board. So then there's quicker response time. There's less um, people needed for this kind of you know, labor and, and um, needed to actually run the operations and, and whatnot. So as people see the importance of data, this is the big thing. So prior to today, um, we data wasn't that much of an issue, right? Uh, basically, 4G was just used for voice. Now, as data and data analytics and, and just the amount of information that needs to be processed on a day-to-day -day basis is just so much, that's where actually 5G comes in. And so um, I, too, am also getting a lot of pushback. It's like, it's the same thing with smart cities. Do we need smart cities yet? Do we need 5G yet? And the thing is, we, you know, as we have more information, more data, more devices, the, the higher, the um, lower the latency, the higher the bandwidth, um, the higher the security that we need, the more it becomes um, important that these technologies and the need for smart cities and the, reduce, the reduction of um, energy or reduction of labor, or, or the efficiency of resources that we actually use, as all of these come forth, even pushed by the pandemic that we have today for the need of automation and all this other stuff, it is something that's not just, it's been here for a while. And now, you know, we're seeing much more use cases for it. But again, we all start from the basic level. Um, even the cities that I'm talking to now, now that we, you know, establish the importance of just this basic fundamental infrastructure, now they're starting to get fancy. I was like actually in, in, on an island the other day and they're like, okay, well then can we um, use this for fishing? Now they're understanding, oh, now we have all this information at our fingertips, but then can we get fancy and have some of these drones here that actually help you know, track and monitor X, Y, and Z? Can we use this for tourism? So I think as we're going along, and again, we're in Southeast Asia, we're starting to see um, that tipping point between, okay, we get why data is important, how to use data, and then how to get fancy with other, you know, utilities and devices and, and hardware and software um, to actually help their lives um, in, in their everyday lives, basically. So, yeah. So, so Shen, let me, let me ask you, because, you know, you, you, you've been talking to a variety of these municipalities, and you, you've already sort of illustrated some of the thoughts like, okay, can we use it in tourism? Can we use it in fishing? Uh, but based on your, your myriad discussions with various uh, cities, what, what sort of functionality, what sort of functions are, are sort of emerging as top of mind for a lot of cities when they start thinking about, okay, we wanna lay down 5G infrastructure, we wanna connect all of our data you know, is it just simply digitization of records? Is it, you know, uh, you know, are there are there functions that are really uh, sort of driving uh, their move towards a smart city? Yeah, and and it's actually a fun project. Like every city is different, right? It's not even though okay, as we all know, we all we have to have some kind of template or cookie cutter. If not, we'd like go through seventy seven provinces in Thailand and just kill ourselves, right? But but there are fundamental cookie cutter framework first that everybody needs and that's the, the data, right? All the data in one platform and, and all of that. So security and safety is one fundamental thing. Like we were in, so we just did our first smart city uh, launch. So smart cities in Thailand has been around for a couple, for, for a couple years now. 
frankly, the difference that we're doing is we're putting 5G. So we're the first city to actually use 5G as the enabler, the enabling underlying connectivity. And so as we did that in this one city called um, Banchang, Rayong, they're based in the economic zone of Thailand. And so when we went to them, because they're surrounded by manufacturers and like pollution, all the petrochemicals are there and everything, their use case and problem they wanted to solve was how do we protect our citizens? How do we give them, you know, the most amount of information for them to make sure that, you know, if there's pollution, if there's an explosion, if there's like an attack on one of the ports or whatever, how do we best give that information to, to the, the citizens there? So that was, you know, as we go along to each city, uh, we talk to them about what their main use cases are. So for them, this specific one was citizen safety, uh, citizen health. Um, we also had, because it's actually a port, it's a deep sea port as well. They need to protect their resources in terms of make, making sure that terrorists don't come over and, you know, do something and, you know, whatever. So the monitoring use with the, with the uses of, drones is actually a big thing to see if you know there's people coming out in the middle of the night blah 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 and all that other stuff so yeah everybody's different but underlying thing goes back to the basic information infrastructure well it, it, it's great that you sort of touched on uh the use of drones because we happen to have the ceo of the second largest uh drone company in the world so you know uh you know aerodyne operates in in three dozen countries around the world uh, and, and offering uh, about as many different applications, services, and use cases. So, so Cameron, I, I want to ask in your experience, um, you know, which, which types of use cases offer the best potential for cities to become quote unquote smart cities? Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm uh, excited with uh, what uh, Shannon uh, said earlier about uh, all these flying drones and uh, robots and actually that's what drones are right so uh, and it's already being deployed today and in, in terms of uh, areas of applications for uh, smart city um, one of the big ones is actually on uh, mobility and logistics you know uh, uh, the days of jackson is really not that far away you know i reckon within uh, within 10 years it's going to be quite commonplace in every city around the world you know flying cars and, and all that's going to happen and flying cars are really, the future flying cars are really just uh, enlarged drones with no pilot. You know, we're, we're talking about uh, air mobility, urban air mobility is actually uh, fully autonomous, end-to-end uh, -end or rather point-to-point -point, uh, form of transportation. Even if you were to look at all major cities in the world, uh, let's just say from, from uh, Kuala Lumpur to Bangkok, uh, it will take us less than two hours to get there. But it would probably take us another two hours just to get up to our destination in Bangkok itself, for example, right? But if we have urban air mobility, we have these big drones that will be carrying uh, human uh, passengers, we could be talking about, you know, reducing the uh, travel time by maybe 80 to 90 percent because you should be tra traveling point to point. So urban air mobility, I think, is one of the huge uh, 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 technological uh, contributions to uh, smart city. And, and of course, the second one related to this is actually uh, drone delivery. Uh, uh, today, we, we talk about e-commerce. I mean, if it is within the same city, uh, we could get it within a couple of hours or typically within 24 hours. If it is from outside uh, the country, perhaps even three days. I, I mean, it could still happen in the same country as well within three days. Uh, to me, I, I won't be surprised in just a couple of years down the road that we order something, uh, we'll get it in front of our uh, uh, door, uh, uh, something within 15, uh, 15 minutes or, or even 10 minutes in the future as well. So, so I think this is a major contributor uh, in terms of uh, drone technology, uh, logistics and mobility. Uh, on top of that, uh, drone is, I mean, we talk about cities of the future, there's a lot of infrastructure here, whether it's your... Uh, uh, utilities, whether it's buildings and all that. And drone has been the, one of the biggest uh, um, technological introduction that helped in managing this infrastructure. In fact, at Aerodynes today, most of our work are actually are looking uh, at this critical infrastructure around here, from power line to wind turbine to solar farms and all that, right? So imagine this in the future. Uh, we can ex 
expand these uh, solutions by using drone uh, in the cities, looking after all the infrastructures uh, in the cities itself, from our roads, from our buildings and all that. And it's not just monitoring them, uh, but uh, soon drone will be doing the fixing by itself, you know, cleaning the, the buildings and all that. And all of these are fully autonomous, uh, mission driven. Uh, if, if you understand drone today, it's still piloted. You're talking about uh, you're planning the mission and you will send a team to go and do it. So uh, cities of the future will see that this, first you have all of this surveillance drone that go around, uh, equipped with AI capabilities, detecting faults, detecting risks and all that. And you will have drones that will then be sent to do the fixing itself as well. So this is actually, uh, again, no longer a staff of science fiction. It's already been tested. Uh, and in, in many cases, they are ready to be deployed. Uh, the only reason why we don't see them deployed yet is only because uh, we have regulatory constraints, we have uh, acceptance issues, so we still just need a little bit more time uh, to get uh, society to uh, accept uh, this kind of uh, uh, technology. And, and related to that as well, um, I would say uh, security and, and uh, surveillance uh, that can be deployed or rather provided by these uh, smart drones of the future uh, from providing, uh, you know, uh, simple stuff like uh, traffic and environmental monitoring. Uh, Shannon also mentioned about floods and all that. So it's all can come into this category. But on top of that, um, I think um, one of the big uh, contributor here is actually on the actual uh, security and surveillance itself uh, against threat of uh, crime, uh, threat of uh, sovereignty and all that. Uh, we'll be already deploying uh, similar solutions right now using drone drones. They are in the box. Uh, today, it's all about um, uh, controlling these drones from a remote location rather than having a full crew to be able to operate in them. Uh, but again, as I uh, gave some clue of what's coming in the future, these drones are collaborating um, uh, under swarm uh, technology uh, where it is actually mission driven rather than uh, operated by human pilots on the ground. And, and this, this transition is already happening now. And I, I do see collectively all these various uh, uh, drone based and, and data technology that comes from the drone will have a significant impact uh, towards future society and in, in the uh, future cities. Cameron, you, you bring up really two fascinating approaches to the application of, of technology in enacting a smart cities. Uh, strategy, you know, one is sort of, you know, the, the smart enhancement of activities that, that that people already do. So using drones as, you know, uh, as ways of inspecting critical infrastructure, probably more quickly, more safely, more efficiently uh, using that for repairs. So getting into kind of the robotics that, that, that Shannon was talking about, but you also take it in a very, very uh, disruptive, almost futuristic direction. So looking at drones as a, you know, you know, I, I think to your point, you know, uh, autonomous flying vehicles really just being, you know, gigantic drones on steroids. And so I, I imagine when a lot of people think about, you know, industrial or, you know, municipal uses of drones, they're probably thinking more of the former. So how do we use it for inspection, monitoring, surveillance? Uh, but you know, it, it, it takes a great leap of imagination to realize that the types of technologies you're doing now can completely uh, you know, disrupt and maybe even decimate a traditional industry like, like transportation. Uh, you know, are there other areas that you, know, you see where drones could be that potentially uh, seismic in their disruption that maybe your average layperson hasn't taken into consideration, especially maybe a city mayor or a city technologist that didn't realize that drones could actually have that kind of an impact? Uh, certainly. In, in another area, uh, perhaps it's not the city itself, but at the fringe of the city is actually agriculture, which is food. Food is very important for the city dwellings as well, right? Uh, and uh, uh, today we're already experiencing um, uh, you know, food security in, in many countries around the world. Right? Uh, we are having issues producing uh, enough food for current population and picture this uh, about uh, future populations as well. Right? 
So uh, uh, time, it is often now uh, very prime for disruption in terms of agriculture itself. And drone uh, can and will all will play a significant impact, um, a significant role uh, in improving uh, this this situation, um, like what we are doing right now, for example, um, out of this pandemic. Uh, in in many countries and in Malaysia, where I, I I'm uh, our HQ is right now, um, Malaysia rely on a lot of foreign labor uh, in our agricultural sector. Right um, and and uh, because of the border control and all that, these foreign labels were not able to uh, travel into Malaysia. That's number one. And number two, uh, our food production in Malaysia, for example, is not uh, yet uh, sufficient to feed the whole population. So we import uh, a lot of food into the country, and because of these uh, uh, issues that we are facing right now under COVID nineteen, uh, all of these are putting it at risk. So because of that, a year ago, we, we introduced a new solution, uh, which we call Agrimod, which is about uh, mechanizing, it's all about modernizing agriculture as well. And, and I, I won't be surprised, um, you know, uh, in, in the near future, uh, we will be able to um, uh, increase our yield uh, significantly, not just through the mechanization using drone, but, itself, but also using various sensors and deep analytics that allow us to actually uh, um, increase our yield to fit the population increase in our cities of the people. Amazing, amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, I want to I want to sort of take things in a slightly different direction because, you know, our topic is not just about building smart cities, but also about building sustainable cities. So I, I want to return to Shannon and, and ask uh, you uh, in what ways can 5G uh, enable cities or even its residents to become more sustainable. You know, what, what are some of the, the the UN Sustainable Development Goals that you see are potentially advanced by five G technology? I think I think one one of the really enlightening conversations that I've had recently with um, with this one island municipality mayor was that you know during the pandemic now. Um, it's given me time to think, and this is the, and as we're nearing, you know, we're getting the vaccinations, you know, tourism, high season's about to open up at the end of this year. What can I do with the current state that it is because to reset my island, to basically build in like regulations, like basically this island has been an island that a lot of party goers go to and it hasn't been of the least sustainable at, in any way and um the, the just litter and pollution and it's a lot of waste um and and just he was just saying you know the this past year and a half it's made me like rethink things and i want to do it differently and i'm like getting goosebumps there because like there's a 60 year old mayor you know, who knows nothing about technology, right? Let alone 5G, right? That that basically is like, I want to reimagine this. Like, can I use technology and 5G and whatever to, to help this? And the answer is yes. So, so, you know, as we went along and we talked about the different things, like there were many different, you know, just having data at your fingertips, you know, that was already efficiency and, and um, and resource utilization efficiency, right? Then we went to safety. I mean, that's, I mean, I have all these SDG goals that I'm covering here. There's like um, good health and well being, right? So we have like basically this island has um, a few mountains and there's been issues where the doctors cannot get to the people in the mountains in time, right? So, you know, how do we use 5G? Well, because you can't use like 4G is going to be quite difficult because of the, the bandwidth and, and how fast, you know, the images travel and whatnot. Um, you could always use fiber optics as well, but then that's really expensive to like drill through all the mountains, right? So, so 5G does help in, in so many different ways. Um, I think the, the takeaway from everything that so far I've been doing with the municipality, what's been great is it's it's given us a new beginning, you know, with this whole pandemic and everything. And I feel that a lot of people are actually thinking about sustainability without us even trying to push it down their throats. 
And so I think, you know, the pandemic basically has given us a nice wake up call and to act to actually be able to use technology and 5G to help this and set it up with the right frameworks um, is, is really exciting. That, that, that's very encouraging. And it, and it sounds like, you know, even someone like this, this uh, island mayor is is taking an approach that, that Callum had sort of advocated at the beginning that, you know, he's not thinking about it from technologies, but very much from a problem solution sort of uh, perspective. Uh, and, and he's looking at different problems that, you know, do tie into things like, you know, what, what, what Cameron's doing with uh, Aerodyne. I, I think the, the whole idea of, you know, medical care and, and sort of merging that with drones uh, very much reminds me of uh, the drone company Zipline uh, in East Africa, which uses drones to shoot out, you know, uh, blood and, and, and medications to um, rural areas of, of, of Rwanda and other parts of East Africa. I want to I want to turn back to to Cameron for a moment and ask, you know, if if sustainability factors into you know Aerodyne strategy, uh, or into discussions uh, of your service offerings when you engage with clients, does the the topic of sustainability come up in shaping your service contracts? Are there sort of performance metrics that go along with it that you know, are specific around impact and, and sustainability? Certainly. I mean, um, uh, a lot of our uh, customers are very conscious about uh, carbon footprint, for example, you know, and, and among others. Uh, and of course, um, if, if, I were, if you were to take the easy way out, one of the challenges in, in flying drones is actually uh, the endurance. And we can solve them easily by using uh, 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 patrol-based drones, <laughs> but they're not only noisy, but of course there's impact to the environment as well. But because of the sustainability uh, concern, uh, we are now operating our drone uh, using electrical drones, electric drones, um, uh, battery-powered. Uh, we're also moving towards uh, nuclear-powered <laughs> drones as well in the future. Uh, you know, small little drones, uh, small little battery can power it for very very long time so it's very interesting uh, technology coming up uh, coming uh, along this way as well so yeah yeah definitely uh, sustainability is a big issue uh, likewise a few other things as well like cyber security is also a big issue for, for our clients as well especially uh, data sovereignty because we are operating around the world where those data resides and all that so yeah i mean it's it's it's, it's very much uh, ingrained in our operation it doesn't really uh, make itself into the contract itself, but it's like uh, one of the big criteria for most of our clients as well. So almost that, you know, it's, it's almost like it's ingrained or implied uh, as part of that service. Um, you know, Callum, I, I know that, uh, you know, <laughs> we haven't talked to you in a, a little while, uh, but, but, but let me ask, in, in your work with both uh, the UNDP and with the various cities uh, that you've dealt with that are engaged in smart city strategy, you know, how prominent are sustainability issues featured in discussions and development plan? And if, if so, you know, what, what's, which sort of issues or SDGs uh, are the most prominent in the minds of different cities? That's cool. And I wasn't taking it personally. It's great to hear from uh, everyone else. So um, we do see sustainability featuring. Um, Shannon did a great um, overview earlier of the different sustainable um, SDGs, but we see SDG 11 um, around sustainable cities and communities. Uh, featuring, but also around climate change. So SDG 13, um, as I mentioned earlier, features quite often too. Um, and I think there's an interesting tension here as well, where cities are one of the biggest causes of climate change in terms of emissions, and they're responsible for nearly 75% um, of, of CO2 emissions. But the other half of that is that they are also particularly affected by the consequences of climate change. Um, around 90% of all urban areas are actually on the world's coasts. So any kind of increase in global temperatures and then... Um, uh, sea levels are going to have a, a serious and detrimental impact and similarly we're seeing the increase of temperature having very negative impacts on the functioning of cities their infrastructure and so on um, but in terms of sustainability plans um, we do see the kind of implementation and the approach vary quite a lot between cities um, Shannon had a, a great point here earlier where that underlying infrastructure is really fundamental and things like data um, infrastructure are really important in actually driving sustainability um, in terms of targets, indicators, or even be able to understand what does and doesn't work. And so in some countries, in some cities, we see that infrastructure is strong. In others, there's still a kind of a little bit further to go as well. Um, I think what's also really interesting is the kind of opportunities to share uh, best practice and to learn from each other as well. 
Um, you mentioned earlier an example from, from um, East Africa, Zipline. They're doing fantastic work around drone deployments. Um, so there's actually a lot that we could even do around south to north learning. So what can more higher income countries learn from lower income counterparts around things like drone delivery? Or we saw in, um, in Kenya, mobile money was launched in 2008. It didn't get to Singapore until 2014 and London even after that. So how can we look at um, developing those kind of relationships and those networks so that sustainability is generally a kind of um, joint and genuine journey as well. Um, I think when we talk about the SDGs as well, it's sometimes forgotten that they're all interrelated. Um, so sustainability is not just about SDG 13 or SDG 11. Um, and I think this is where smart cities are really fundamental for all of the SDGs, as, um, as Shannon mentioned earlier. So gender equality about improving opportunities for, for women and others, um, tackling poverty, poverty about be providing better livelihoods, um, and then, as, as um, Cameron mentioned earlier, the kind of role of urban food and supply chains for tackling zero hunger as well. So I think when we talk about sustainability, it needs to be a very kind of genuine and holistic uh, conversation as well, and not just getting siloed into one SDG or one part of the city either. You know, you bring up a fascinating point in that cities are recognizing that they're both the source of many climate issues as well as the recipient of many of its negative impacts, because it, it does sort of create kind of a straight line between, you know, what they're doing and what they can do to mitigate. You know, I, I think unlike a lot of climate situations, particularly at a country level, where the action of uh, that, that, that sort of creates a problem uh, and the impact sort of happen in two different places. One country might do something that impacts you know, the environment or climate, but the negative effect is felt somewhere else. And so when it comes to things like solutions, you know, helping come up with solutions or learning, it's always that not in my backyard sort of uh, thinking, because, you know, if it doesn't affect me here, then it's not my problem. Uh, but cities recognizing that, you know, we as a city might be negatively impacting climate and the environment, and we are now facing the effects of that. I think it, it gives me hope that we'll probably see more resources and action mobilized uh, around creating more sustainable cities and environments. So I think that's that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I, I think that, that that's a great sort of overall way to, to, to cap a discussion about sustainability. Um, you know, I, I would like to take the last part of our panel uh, and probably address a concern that, you know, we can spend a lot of time uh, being very positive and hopeful and inspired about technology and sustainability. But, you know, because we're, we're talking about um, technologies that are highly interconnected, and that is a word that's come up a few times, you know, that level of interconnection also creates a lot of concern around uh, security, particularly cybersecurity, because, you know, unlike the old regime where technology sort of resided in a company and you had a single point of attack, you know, when you talk about IoT devices and people are estimating that these devices, whether it's sensors, whether it's drones, will number in, you know, upwards of 50 billion, uh, you know, in, you know, in the next, uh, you know, 30 years, as we start to roll out smart infrastructure, smart cities, we do actually have to spend a lot of time thinking about cybersecurity. So let me ask, you know, Shannon, let me start with you. Um, how concerned uh, do we need to be about cybersecurity when it comes to 5G networks? How safe uh, is 5G uh, to, to third party attack? And in your conversation with, with potential city clients, how soon into the conversation before the topic of cybersecurity comes up? So when we first um, started this 5G project, we were debating on um, what, what underlying 5G core technology we should use and what data there is that we're going to be collecting and, and what impact the, that data is on anybody. And, and, you know, when we were initially starting to talk to some of the municipality mayors, they're like, oh, we don't care. I mean, it's just like weather patterns. You know, and, and so like, I think um, in Asia, we are a little bit not as stringent in terms of our privacy and, and our, our data. And um, frankly, we don't care as much as the rest of the world about our data protection, but more and more what's come to light is um, 
is how all of these interconnective sets of data are actually becoming a threat, not just at a um, city level, local level, city level, um, regional, and then national level as well. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the Chinese versus the US and, and all these different kind of data laws, PDPA, all, all this other stuff. And so um, with the dawn of 5G, what's actually happened is the technology and equipment has allowed data to be kept closer to the edge or closer to the core. So there's this new thing called private networks that 5G actually offers. And nowadays, if you are, you know, um, ABC city, you're able to keep all of your information at your city. You're, it doesn't have to go back to the telco operators anymore. It doesn't have to go back to, you know, the, the country of origin of the, the equipment, depending upon which country that is from. Um, we see 5G and the core technologies as being something that actually helps um, um, limit, you know, the, the security issue, the cybersecurity. Um, but having said that, when do you start? You have to start at the designing stage of things. You have to have this in mind before you actually, you know, because in, in, like you said, there's now different parts where there are breach, potential breaches at the sensor level, the server level, at the cloud level, at the, you know, underlying you know, equipment level, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it needs to be done on day one and it, it can't be taken lightly unless there's a leak. Even if you don't think your data is important now, it could be in the future. So, um, yeah, it's just something that I think Asians we don't put too much importance on, but but um, now more and more we we need to. Yeah, and I think that gets right back to you know the point that was made early on about smart cities. You know, uh, it, it very much needs there needs to be a lot of thought and planning and design. Uh, it, it is. It isn't about just throwing technology. It's a. It's about systems thinking, systems planning, systems design. So, um, yeah, that's you know, it, it, it. That that's a very very important point. You know, uh, Cameron, you, you touched this. You touched on this a little bit uh, in, in in your previous response uh, about cybersecurity as it relates to drones. Um, how vulnerable are drone fleets uh, to hacks? Uh, and and how you know is this is this a, a point that comes up in conversation with your clients when they talk up to you about uh, your services or do they just assume look you know uh, they'll figure it out I don't really need to know about this or do, do, are they are they really engaged and do they want to talk about cybersecurity? Actually, uh, Paul is the most important thing. Is the first hoops that we have to jump through, right? Especially we uh, typically deal with uh, critical infrastructure. Right, it's very sensitive. I mean, especially when we're working globally as well, and and uh, our security, cyber security plans, our our systems that we put in place always come under scrutiny. It's always almost uh, passport for operation. Without this, we won't be able to even deliver or even get engaged by our customer. It is is the most important thing, uh, and and especially in the uh, uh, today's era uh, where where data sovereignty is one of the biggest issues. So when we do work for our client in Europe, for example, the data stays in Europe, uh, our clients in Australia, data stays in Australia, and uh, they also look at how we manage uh, the data itself, the data in integrity of the data, uh, will it be subjected to any potential tempering and all that. So, so it's, it's a very, very key uh, consideration. So as far as um, uh, risk on the drone operation itself, there are real risk as well of, of hijacking and then, and all that, but there are system processes in place. We, we just have to make sure that we are one step ahead of the risk. You know, it's, it's, it's like war today. It's all about uh, technology war. Uh, so we need to have a, a better cyber security system than the threat out there. So we, we, we just have to be one step ahead. But at the moment, there are, there are plenty of uh, uh, um, uh, responses or systems that we have already adopted that gives that comfort to, to our customers. Uh, again, a simple answer to your question. It's the most, it's the number one thing that is being asked for our client, by our clients. If you don't pass this question, uh, we can't even talk to them. Basically. So, it, you know, it, it, so Shannon's not just into 5G. You're not just into drones. Anyone dealing with smart cities and smart infrastructure is by default 
involved in the cybersecurity business. You're, you're all cybersecurity uh, professionals. Uh, that, that's interesting. Um, and, and I'd like to sort of wrap things up by, you know, we, we started with Callum, we're, we're going to end with Callum, we're going to pull it back out to sort of that broad level. We started broad, went, you know, very micro, and we're going to pull it back out. So, so Callum, at, at a broad policy level, how much of a priority uh, do cities who are, who are planning and developing and implementing smart cities initiatives place on cybersecurity? You know, how, how many of the cities that UNDP has engaged or worked with have made security a centerpiece of their strategy or, you know, have installed, you know, a chief information security officer? Very generous of you letting me kind of bookend this discussion. So uh, thanks for that. Um, so I think in, in recent weeks, we've really seen the importance of, of cybersecurity, um, the ransomware attacks and so on coming out of the, of the states and, and so on. Um, but for cities as well, as, as Shannon mentioned earlier, who are in charge of key services, uh, critical infrastructure, it's a really, really crucial aspect. Um, and then we're also seeing things like cross-border data, cloud and data sovereignty as well, where cities are working together, even across borders or providing services at a kind of broader level where cybersecurity becomes another dimension too. Um, so I think from many of the cities that we've worked with, uh, cybersecurity is definitely on their radar. Um, and then some are definitely further along with implementation or engaging with this and others. Um, and interestingly as well, it's not necessarily a dichotomy between you know, higher income countries are doing well and lower income countries aren't. We actually see some great examples coming out of lower income cities as well, who sometimes have less infrastructure or kind of more catalyst for, for innovation and change. Um, but I think also, as Shannon mentioned earlier, there are some real challenges with implementing cybersecurity um, from building skills locally, from shaping workflows, um, but also kind of having a mandate and kind of senior ownership within your organization. Um, and I think the challenge as well is that cybersecurity isn't a single topic. It's everything from protecting 4G and 5G infrastructure through to making sure civil servants don't fall victim to phishing or losing their passwords and, and so on. Um, and I think often from my experience of working in technology, the tech is the comparatively easy bit. The harder bit is that kind of organizational and individual change management, behavior change and so on, that I think cybersecurity is a really fundamental challenge around. You mentioned um, kind of roles like uh, chief information systems officers and, and information security officers as well. Um, and I think these have real merit. Uh, we saw a great initiative a few years ago with the Rockefeller Foundation uh, building out chief resilience officers, um, and they had real traction in many cities. But I think what that really highlighted is that you can't um, embody your entire cybersecurity strategy in one individual, particularly if they don't have a mandate or responsibility for change. This again needs to be really systemic and pervasive throughout your organization. Um, and I think that's a really fundamental way of achieving cybersecurity. It's everyone's responsibility um, and everyone has a kind of um, focus on achieving it for a city um, as well. Amazing. So last question, uh, Callum, w which cities are getting it right? You know, who's, w which cities, ha you know, have, have basically taken that entire, you know, holistic problem solution uh, set. They, they've thought through the issues. They, they put sustainability and security front and center. Who, who's racing ahead of the pack that we should all look to as a case study? <laughs> um, it's not an easy question. Um, I think we're seeing some great stuff coming out of the, the ASEAN Smart Cities Network in this part of the world. Um, and Shannon has mentioned many examples um, from the countries she's worked in. Um, we also touched upon earlier uh, Rwanda and Kigali. Um, they have a very forward thinking approach to technology and innovation including that kind of people-centered approach. So I think that's another one that we see um, exciting things coming from too. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I think, you know, uh, every time I'm in East Africa, people always refer to, you know, Kigali as sort of, the, and, and Rwanda as sort of the Singapore of East Africa. So, uh, so yeah, yay for, for Southeast Asia. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so let's move on to the uh, to our audience. I'm sure there's a lot of Q&A that people uh, would be keen to get answers to. Okay, perfect. Uh, and it looks like we've got uh, Cameron. I see Shannon, we got Callum, perfect. Uh, well, that was a great session. Um, we have a flood of questions and uh, unfortunately, we only have about 15 minutes to, you know, we could easily uh, spend the next hour going through all the questions we've gone through. So uh, it, it's fantastic that we have a, a very interested and engaged audience. Um, let, let me, uh, I, I've reserved at least one question for each of you. And if we have time, we'll try and go through some of the others. Um, but, you know, Callum, I'm, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we'll start in the same order that we, we, we launched um, uh, the panel. 
and, and this is a very interesting angle. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have a question that asks that, you know, how does, uh, how does sufficient affordable housing and financing fit into uh, the concept of sustainable cities? Uh, you know, how does that fit? Um, what have you seen, uh, you know, around the world in terms of, you know, how to provide uh, sufficient affordable housing and fit that into a sustainable city strategy? Excellent. <laughs> not, not an easy question. Um, so none I'm, of them are. I, yeah, so no, no, no. I, I just want to let everyone on the panel know they're all tough Definitely. questions. <laughs> no one so, gets off easy for this one. No, exactly. So I'm by no means a, a housing expert, but I think um, what we need to go back to is the kind of founding principles of the smart city, that notion of inclusivity, livability and, and sustainability. So I think when we're designing any kind of um, element of the smart city, be it housing, public services, or other aspects, really focusing on those notions of um, inclusion, first and foremost, to make sure that we're providing high quality and, and affordable and inclusive housing, livable places as well. So housing shouldn't just be siloed off, it should be a fundamental part of the city fabric, um, and also sustainable, so where we can leverage technology and other innovations as well. Um, Singapore, where we're based, obviously, is a, is a leader globally for affordable and public housing. Um, and we're seeing some great stuff happening here, including things like solar panels on public housing, um, aquaponic um, and hydroponic uh, uh, small scale farms in housing estates. Um, so I think there's a lot of scope here for, for interesting stuff coming out of Singapore too. Um, so in, when you talk to different municipalities, you know, and, and they're, 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 they're forming, you know, their smart city strategies and their policies, is there a conscious effort to acknowledge and find ways to narrow that digital divide because I, I think as as you start introducing digital innovation there's always that threat that you know you start widening the gap between the, the digital haves and have-nots uh, are you seeing cities address this issue head-on yeah uh, it's quite variable but we see it's definitely a priority i think in many cities they often lack the data to understand where there are not spots or to understand who is actually digitally excluded um, and then there's how do you then tackle some of those issues? And it's not a single issue. It's everything from education to access to ownership. Um, and it's very much a kind of longer term piece as well. For example, when we think about something like mobile phone ownership, that's not a linear journey. It's not like you don't have a phone and then you have a phone. That phone could be stolen. It could be sold to, to pay for essential household bills. Um, it could be broken. So I think there's a kind of complexity in that, that journey as well. Um, I think while it is a risk in the digital inclusion side is that a lot of smart city components are essentially um, bringing in the private sector, which has enormous merit, but we need to be cautious that the cities aren't uh, fundamentally outsourcing their responsibilities for inclusion either. So making sure that they are working close to the private sector to ensure that no one um, is left behind. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, Shannon, I, I kind of want to build a little bit about on this concept as well as, you know, it sort of ties into some of the questions that, you know, um, was asked of Mock because, you know, I mean, I think the question I had for Callum is about the sort of divide between, you know, haves and have nots within a given city. But, you know, there are some questions that were shot over to Mock about, you know, turning uh, smaller population centers, villages, towns, uh, making them smart and how do you prevent that sort of divide between, you know, the big urban capitals and maybe, you know, the smaller locations that are looking uh, to become smart. Uh, you know, we talk that, you know, a lot of times infrastructure is a bit of a cost issue. Uh, and you yourself had brought up, you know, conversations you've had with smaller cities, you know, islands, cities, island mayors, you know, uh, how, how do you see um, 5G technology, uh, you know, sort of enabling uh, some of these smaller population centers to become smart, uh, you know, sort of decrease that divide between the big capitals and the smaller towns. That's a tough one, isn't it? Uh, okay, so I think um, as everything, there's a progression. So when we're dealing with uh, the municipalities now, frankly, it doesn't hit the consumer yet. It's a, it's a G to G play or B to G play, where we're actually enabling the, the governments with information and data to make their lives easier. And then with that data, it's 
it extends to the, the citizens, for example, with the population, uh, with the pollution data, with the wastage data, with, you know, all the safety data, then the agencies are able to have more data at their fingertips to react quicker, et cetera, et cetera, and then get, you know, extended to the citizens which have it in their apps. Um, in terms of like, realistically 5G devices, I mean, there's smart cities popping up all over Thailand already. F smart cities is actually not it doesn't need to be 5G yet, because as we're just starting the this new connected cities, smart cities um, era, um, the, the number of devices and the, the amount of data that we're crunching today is not um, is enough, but it's not just to give you an example 4G, you could connect about thousands of, of devices. It's like before when we're at home, we only needed a phone to charge or whatever. And then as we went down the the era, went down the the, the time, um, we had to connect more devices at home, right? The fridge is connected, the TV is connected, blah, 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 blah. Same thing as the city. So on day one, we only had to connect like thousands of devices. As we are progressing, 5G enables you to connect hundreds of thousands of devices. And so, at the end of the day, who needs to connect hundreds of thousands of devices? Who's the best person who is going to be the beneficiary of this? It's going to be the governments, it's going to be the industries, it's going to be B2B and B2G, right? We actually won't get down to where the consumer actually is going to have a CPE or their own device where they're going to use it themselves because frankly, the cell phones that are 5G right now are way too expensive. So we won't be seeing that yet. So the, to answer your question, the way that they will, you know, citizens will be able to um, benefit from this uh, digital um, progression is that from the data that's being extended by the governments and the industries, they're going to see it in their upskilling of their, their talent, you know, because they have to learn how to use the 5G devices or the new technologies, um, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of digital divide, I think it, we will still have it. And just like what Callum said, it's still gonna be quite some time until maybe the Chinese devices start making it cheaper, right? So as devices get cheaper, then um, we're still gonna have that divide for now, unfortunately. Okay, well, you know, I mean, I, and I think, you know, you, you, you also kind of help tie in and summarize a couple of points that have been made uh, throughout this, this seminar. Namely, you know, I think to Callum's earlier point that, you know, a lot of it isn't about how cities deploy technology or throwing technology, you know, at the issue. You know, technology is an important component, but a smart city does depend on, you know, um, you know, problem solution thinking, uh, you know, systems thinking. Um, you know, it may not always require, you know, a technology solution. It may not require the most powerful technology. So I think to the question that was asked of Mock, you know, in some cases uh, it might actually be overkill to use, you know, 5G on an island of, you know, maybe a thousand people, but maybe not so much if it's, uh, you know, 10 million people. Um, so no, that, that, that's, uh, I, I think that that's, that those are important points to make that, you know, you know, smart city strategy doesn't mean the same thing for every city, every population, every problem, um, every, every uh, urban center is going to have a very different strategy. Um, I'd like to ask Hamro, um, you know, in a slightly different tact, and it's probably, you know, I think you might have a slightly easier question here, but, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, we have a, a question that I'm actually quite curious about because, you know, you, you are a technology company, you're an operational company, but I imagine because you're dealing with drones, uh, you know, uh, and you're dealing with transportation, you're dealing with something that deals with airspace, uh, that, you know, a big component of your work uh, involves dealing with government rela uh, relations, regulations, laws, transportation security. How much of your time as an entrepreneur is actually spent on, you know, dealing with things like transportation policy, you know, establishing, you know, flight zones, uh, legalizing, um, you know, making sure there's some sort of licensure for, for drone operators, you know, all the kind of, you know, back office regulatory relatively unsexy stuff uh, of, of running a tech company. You know, how much of your time is spent on it? And does Aerodyne actually have like a dedicated officer and department just thinking about these things all the time? 
Sure, definitely. Uh, in the beginning, I would say half of my time was actually spent to uh, address these concerns and issues. Uh, a basic principle is simple. You know, uh, people are afraid of what they don't understand. So in the early days of drone, uh, people can only think about privacy, security, risk to uh, you know, national security and all that, right? Uh, so, but but of course, to answer your question, just now, now I have dedicated the team that, that address uh, uh, these regulatory issues and all that. So things are uh, much easier right now. Uh, but at the same time, um, if you were to look at the uh, global progress, uh, see uh, some of the countries uh, do play a leading role uh, in adopting technology. So because of that, they have system and processes uh, earlier uh, than the rest. So what has been happening now is that people are comparing notes. Some regulators in one country are adopting other best practices from other countries as well and all that. But that doesn't mean that uh, this is not an easy thing. Um, even the license to fly drones, for example, still vary from country to country. So uh, a lot of the significant part of our energy is actually about uh, getting the compliances, not just from the regulatory side, from the insurance side, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is just like when you want to introduce any new technology as well, you, you need four things uh, to be in place. And one of it is uh, uh, regulatory compliance. Uh, the, other, the other three are technology uh, and technology are always ahead of the curve. The regulators normally take a little bit of time to, to understand the technology and, and all that. So it is just part and parcel of business. And uh, we, we shouldn't even uh, uh, discount uh, the risk or rather the importance of uh, getting societal acceptance. Uh, there are still issues in many countries around the world about flying drone privacy concerns, whether the, these drones are flying outside of your doors, outside of your windows from your uh, buildings and all that. So, so yeah, uh, privacy, confidentiality issues, cybersecurity, as we discussed earlier, these are uh, a lot of hurdles that uh, uh, we need to overcome. Uh, but fortunately, I, I think the, uh, the world is uh, beginning to realize the importance uh, and the impact of, of the technology, especially coupled with AI. So it's not, no longer about uh, just flying these drones, but it's about uh, you know, harnessing data. It's about uh, using the power of AI to optimize. Uh, and with the connectivity, uh, you know, uh, connectivity is actually uh, uh, everything here when it comes to real-time optimization. And, and um, People are beginning to understand that the benefit far outweigh the risks. And uh, as a result, things are a lot uh, easier now. So um, yeah, there were a lot, a lot of issues that we need to overcome. Fortunately, <laughs> the industry is growing. Uh, people are beginning to understand and things are becoming a lot more easier. Some, some countries are more advanced than the others. Uh, but then again, people are now comparing notes. So I think, I think we are heading in the right direction. Thank you very much for that. You know, we have time for one more question. I'm glad you asked about AI because I will. I, I have time to ask one more question. Uh, and so I'm going to throw out the question and any one of you can answer it. Uh, probably only have time for one of you. So anyone who's daring enough to try and tackle this one, this is not an easy one, uh, but we have a question that asks that how would you assess the risk of data bias in machine learning and AI in combination with the massive increase in data collection in smart cities enabled by 5G technology. So uh, does anyone want to try and tackle that? I will personally buy you a, uh, you know, a Starbucks coffee when we meet up, anyone that wants to try and tackle this one. Well, my take, I'll, I'll just give a quick answer to this one. Carol, so I, fantastic. If I don't get yeah. to see you, I will have a drone deliver you a Starbucks coffee. <laughs> so, so my take is that we can't, we can't run away from data bias, uh, especially uh, human are biased in the first place, you know, and, and we designed the algorithm, we designed the AI. Uh, so there's, there's, uh, there's bound to be data, data bias in, in the data that, that, that we get. But fortunately, we can demand for fairness. You know, uh, fortunately, we can also develop uh, algorithm to counter uh, these biases. And these are already been developed. I'm, I'm already seeing this as well. Uh, in, in the beginning, uh, uh, data bias is everywhere. Again, because when we define, design this AI, it comes from us, human. We, we are biased ourselves. And, and because there has been a lot of uh, uh, issues in the past as well, in the public, for example, right? The, uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's a story about uh, an AI that has been developed to recognize uh, human and all that. And because of uh, 
uh, a dark skinned individual was then subsequently recognized as a gorilla, for example, right? So mm. that causes a huge furor, right? So, so that, that kind of uh, thing has actually led to uh, uh, you know, uh, more focus, more, more demand for, for fairness, for, for data biases to be addressed. So I think there's already algorithm being developed uh, and because we are consciously uh, addressing these issues, I, I think uh, uh, things are improving. And not, not to yeah, say no, that, it, yeah. it's, it's fascinating because probably one of the key areas that's mm -hmm. starting to emerge in the field of AI is that of the AI ethicist. Yes, exactly. uh, and some of the biggest uh, tech companies, you know, Google, Microsoft, you know, they, they, they've got AI ethicists, you know, uh, uh, thinking about it. And, you know, they're bringing in ethics, philosophy, uh, you know, um, sociology into the mix. So that's quite fascinating. Um, we, we are pretty much uh, done. I think um, I'm getting the, the flag saying, you know, we, we, we need to, to sort of wrap things up. So uh, before I hand the mic back to uh, JJ, I want to thank, uh, you know, uh, the panelists, uh, Shannon, Cameron, Callum, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mock, for joining us for uh, the Fireside Chat. Uh, I learned a great deal. I hope everyone in the audience has as well. Uh, I will throw it back to JJ to kind of wrap things up and maybe make any announcements about some of our other webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And a special thanks to Callum, Kamarol, and Shannon for joining us today and tackling those um, hard questions from our audience. Um, I think all of us can walk away now with a deeper level of understanding about what smart cities and smart infrastructure is all about. And you know, considerations with respect to the speed of digitalization, um, government regulation, cybersecurity, and uh, sustainability. So I hope everyone in the audience got a chance to ask their questions. And if not, feel free to reach out to our speakers on their LinkedIn. Um, and Gobi will be hosting more events like these. So let us know what you'd like to hear from us in the post-event email survey. Um, and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram to keep abreast of news and events, anything related to technology and innovation. Um, and speaking of events, I'd like to announce two pitch competitions that Gobi Partners is currently accepting applications for. Um, the first one is um, the first one is a regional pitch competition for social and impact entrepreneurs in Thailand and Vietnam, Singapore, and Indonesia. So you can apply to gain mentorship and pitch at the regional entrepreneurship world cup um, for a chance to go to the global stage and win 1 million US dollars in cash prize. Um, applications are open until July 12th. Um, and then the second one, we can go to the next page. Yep, the second is a regional pitch competition for gender lens startups in Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. So if you're an early stage female founder or female impact startup looking for a stage to pitch um, and get mentorship from investors, um, you can win up to 50,000 US dollars at the global competition. Um, so for this one, applications are open until the end of July. Um, you can find more information to apply on our social media at Gobi Partners. So um, yep, that's it for me for today. Thank you all and you know, hope to see you at our next event.